Hello and welcome. This is the breach notification, still the 800-pound gorilla webinar. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide, and I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we are going to uh, handle this the way we handle all our webinars is that we will take questions along the way. And then we have some time reserved at the end for formal Q&A. So uh, we'll take as many questions as we can go on uh, while we're in um, the webinar itself, while, while we're in a particular context, because I think that's the way that it makes uh, the most sense. And that's how um, you guys, the audience, I believe, get the most value out of it. Anyway, so the agenda today is we're going to cover what the learning objectives are, background with respect to breach notification. We're going to cover the following. When is it triggered? kind of notification to stakeholders that needs to be provided, tracking security incidents, which is really breach notification 101, the cost of noncompliance, and do an omnibus rule summary. We're a year out from the omnibus rule. The omnibus rule has caused a lot of confusion, a lot of myth-making out there, so we want to clarify what it was and what it wasn't, and then obviously we'll have formal QA at the end. We actually have this webinar reserved until 3.30, so if, if you can and you want to stick around, we will go till 3.30 answering questions if there are questions. So the learning objectives is we want to provide a foundational understanding of breach notification under the High Tech Act by reviewing the following, a methodology for determining when notification is triggered. And by the way, what we're going to cover today is what you need to comply with HHS's audit protocol with respect to breach notification, which if anyone has looked at the audit protocol, it is really breach notification, compliance with the breach notification rule under the protocol is really treated different. It's really treated more as an awareness requirement. Do you have a methodology in place? Do you have templates in place? Do you know how to notify individuals, et cetera, et cetera? And we're going to cover that. Specific methods by which notification must be carried out once triggered. These methods are embedded in the statute, right? These are statutory requirements vis-a-vis uh, -vis how you go about providing notification. Processes and tracking mechanisms that must be instituted in order to manage security incidents. One of the first things I would ask if I were performing an audit is A, who's your security officer? B, who's your privacy officer? C, show me how you track security incidents. Who, who who, uh, who do they get reported to? How do you document them? If you can't answer those three basic questions, it's going to be a long day for you. Four, we want to talk about cost and risk related to PHI data breaches. If you stay tuned and follow us on our newsletter, next month's newsletter, the November newsletter, is going to talk about cyber liability insurance. We may cover that a little bit today. And the November webinar will be about a more uh, in-depth look at cyber liability insurance pros and cons. And finally, as we stated up front, we want to do an omnibus rule summary uh, just to try to clarify some of the the vagueness that's out there regarding the omnibus rule. So net and net, we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your breach notification compliance initiative should be implemented going forward. So High Tech Act really has, it's a three-legged stool. You have the privacy rule, the security rule, and what was introduced under the High Tech Act, brand new, right? It never existed before. It was the breach notification rule. The only other rule uh, that you need to be aware of is the enforcement rule. That rule is hardly ever talked about because, you know, if you're dealing with the enforcement rule, that means that you're responding to an audit or a lawsuit, and then you have your uh, attorneys already involved, so there are there are four rules, but this is these are the ones that really you need you need to worry about from a compliance perspective. And the High Tech Act touched uh, in very deep ways all three rules. So the omnibus rule it went into effect on September twenty third, twenty thirteen, and it encompasses changes to the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification, and the enforcement rule. The omnibus rule is not a rule. That's one thing that you need to understand right off the bat. It's not a separate rule. The omnibus rule was a gathering of modifications into a 500-page PDF, modifications and commentary into a 500-page PDF 
with those modifications being to the privacy rule, the security rule, breach notification, and enforcement rules. So there is no standalone omnibus rule. It's just a rule that modified. It's called the rule, but all it did was modify these other four rules. Now, throughout this presentation, if you see an orange hand, that's going to indicate that it is a change introduced by or an example provided by the omnibus rule. There was a lot of commentary in that 500-page PDF. The commentary is useful reading if you're really bored one night and you want something to put you to sleep. But in all seriousness, if you're a, a privacy officer, security officer, attorney that has to deal with it, there's a lot of good commentary. And as you know, you know HHS rarely gives a lot of commentary. They took the opportunity to do so in that PDF. I would uh, take advantage of that and read it. So question number one is when is breach notification triggered? Before we get to that question, let's review. This breach notification was introduced by the High Tech Act. The High Tech Act has been promulgated, has been in effect now since 2009. The clock started ticking on breach notification since 2009. The interim rules have been out there for a long time. The omnibus rule did not trigger the notification rules. It had already been triggered, so you've already had a grace period. The omnibus rule did give grace periods for some BAA agreements and some other things like that, but it didn't trigger breach notification. It had already been triggered. These are the sections from the High Tech Act, and if you click on these, you will be taken to the HIPAA Survival Guide and you can read the full text. So, notification case of breach 13402, that's the part of the High Tech Act where breach notification came from, where it was introduced. I'm going to quickly walk through these sections just so that you're aware of them. 13402A says that CEs, covered entities, must notify individuals. So individuals and HHS always have to be notified. Okay, HHS, well, and we're going to get to this, HHS either is going to get notified within 60 days of a breach, depending on the number, or it's going to get notified at the end of the year or within 60 days of the end of the calendar year. Individuals and HHS always are notified. All right. Business associates don't do the notification. Business associates must notify their covered entities. It's covered entities' responsibility to notify. Notification in general must be no later than no later than 60 days after discovery. So obviously you can't notify if you if you don't know about it. And if you're a BA, you got a certain duty to report you know, within a certain period of time. 13402E specific notification methods are required depending on the number of individuals whose PHI was breached. We're going to talk about these things, but this is the re this is the statutory part, and then we got the regulations that HHS issued in response to the statute. 13402F, the notification must contain specific content, uh, and 402H, unsecured, the definition contains the undefinition of unsecured PHI, which means that PHI that's not secured through encryption and or destruction, but not any old encryption and not any old destruction as provided by HHS guidance, and the methods must render the PHI unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable. Those are, that's the, the mantra, unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable. Really, in the interim breach notification rule, if I recall correctly, that's where HHS pointed to the NIST standards, and we're going to cover this, they're in your slides, uh, that you have to comply with if you want to take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. In other words, if you do encrypt and destroy according to the protocols, you can take advantage of the safe harbor, and then there's no breach by definition. And I would encourage anyone listening, that's the first thing you ought to be thinking about is encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Okay, I'm going to stop right here and just ask Martin if there's any questions at this point. Not at this point. Okay, so notification case breach, unsecured PHI. If PHI has been secured as per the guidance, you get the safe harbor. There's no notification by no no, no notification is not triggered by definition. There can't be a breach if you're if you are in, in other words, there can't be a breach if you are encrypting according to the protocols. Uh, despite the safe harbor, however, there may be other federal and state PHI laws that remain in full force and effect. So. Just as a general warning, you're always going to have to check and, and, and um, to see what 
your state laws are because if they're more stringent than HIPAA, then you have to comply with the state laws. And the states are smart; they're not going to they're not going to enact laws that are less stringent than HIPAA, so that HIPAA would preempt any laws they enact are going to be in general more stringent. Which means you got to comply with HIPAA and you got to comply with the state laws and every state law that you operate. Now, here's the definition of breach. The unauthorized acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of PHI, which compromises the security or privacy of such information, except where an authorized person to whom such information is disclosed would not be able to retain such information, which is just Greek, right? That I mean, we're going to parse this thing to try to uh, give you an understanding of this legal gobbledygook here, right? It's just it's vague. Um, on purpose, uh, if you will. You really got to break it down to understand it. Now, we talked about the High Tech Act uh, um, and the sections there. Subpart D, 45 CFR 164, subpart D. And again, if you go out to the, if you click on these, there are URLs. These are the regulations that HHS promulgated in response to the High Tech Act, right? So that's how that works, right? The Congress makes laws, the agencies generally respond with regulations. Now this graphic here is meant to show that subcontractors of business associates are also now on the hook and if you had a chain of subcontractors the business associate would would notify in the case of a breach business associate would notify its business associate and then the first line business associate that has a relationship with the covered entity would notify the covered entity and then and, it's the covered entity's responsibility, depending on the circumstances, to notify HHS, the patient, and the media, missing the A. But remember, HHS and the patient, the individual, is always notified only under specific conditions is the, does the media have to be notified. So there's still uh, a lot of confusion as to who and who is not a business associate and whether or not there are different types of business associates, and, and the question is, yes, obviously there are different types, but what there's not is any business associate light version of compliance. In other words, if you're a business associate, you have to comply with the entirety of the privacy rule, the entirety of the breach notification rule, and the entirety of the security rule. Yes, I know that it doesn't say the entirety of the security rule, but it says the safe, the the administrative safeguards, the physical safeguards, the technical safeguards, the general rule, they might as well say the entirety because that's 99.99% of the security rule. So you're on the hook statutorily no matter what kind of BA you are. Okay, and this is out of the regulations. This has been in there forever. Accountants, consultants, lawyers, any individual that performs a business function on behalf of a covered entity wherein that business function requires the business entity to review look at, touch, access, PHI, that makes you a business associate. And that relationship comes into play or into existence by operation of law. Not because you've got a BAA agreement between these two parties, by operation of law. If you meet that definition of performing a business function on behalf of a covered entity, wherein on a regular basis you have to look at PHI to do that business function that you're doing for your partner, the covered entity, then you're a BA. Okay, and we're going to talk more about that. But of course, EHR vendors, PHR vendors, if the personal health records, if it's hooked to an EHR, other software vendors, HIOs, regional HIOs, all these guys are examples of business associates. So what? Well, the relationship between the covered entity and a BA must be contractual. So you've got to have an agreement, first of all. And if the product or service provider requires a disclosure of PHI. And so what high tech has done is really increase the number of cooks in the compliance kitchen. There's just a lot more people now. I'll let you in on a little secret. Prior to the High Tech Act, HIPAA was an unenforced paper tiger. The dirty little secret was that everybody knew who in the industry it was unenforced. Now high tech has given HIPAA real teeth and the world has also changed okay between 2005 when the security rule first went into effect and now the world has changed now we live on in a 24 7 always on online world 
you know, a cyber warfare. We don't live in the same world, and so that teeth has a lot more meaning now than it did even in 2005 by by an order of magnitude. So what are what are BAs uh, on the hook for? They're directly liable under 13404A, this is going back to the High Tech Act, for uses and disclosures that violate the privacy rule or are in breach of the BA contract. So there you go. You can't use or disclose PHI that violates the privacy rule. BAs are not permitted to use or disclose PHI if it would be a privacy rule violation for the CE to do. You know, if it's a violation for the CE, it's a violation for you. BA may use PHI for its own management administration. That's sort of obvious because if you couldn't do that, then you couldn't perform the business function that you um, that the covered entity needs you to perform. Again, this comes into play here. It says by definition, but the the more legal ease term is it becomes the you become a BA by operation of law. Therefore, liability attaches immediately, whether or not you have an agreement. It doesn't matter. If you create, receive, maintain, transmit PHI on behalf of a CE, you're on the hook. You're a business associate. And now subcontractors of BAs are now BAs, so you got this chain of BAs now, and they must comply with the rules. That means that you have to have uh, a, a BA to BA agreement, right? And if you're the first line of BA with your covered entity, you're going to have to have a BAA with the covered entity. So you can get lost in the acronyms. We, as part of our subscription plan, we actually have a business associate contract between that can be used between a covered entity and a business associate and one that can be used between two business associates because they're not radically different but they're different enough that we needed uh, we felt we, we needed to create two um, so to summarize and the omnibus rule made this clear BAs are now directly liable under the HIPAA rules for impermissible uses and disclosure that's the privacy rule failure to provide breach notification that's obviously the breach notification rule Failure to provide access to EPHI. There's some there's some provisions in the privacy rule. These aren't in the security rule where you may have to provide access to EPHI if you are hosting or have the EPHI under your control access uh, to the individual to the patient, right? And so and and and, and everyone's rushed to compliance. People are rightly uh, focusing on the security rule, but don't lose track of these what we call these patient's bill of rights that are in the privacy rule that start with 164.520 and go through 164.528. You could be surprised if you're not uh, aware of what those the implications of those sections, both for cover entities and MBAs. You're on the hook for failure to disclose PHI to the secretary if asked, for failure to provide an accounting of disclosures, for failure to comply with the requirements of the security rule. Basically, you're on the hook for those three rules. That's what this is saying. So, you know, the bottom line is we're not, with respect to BAs and CE, we're just not in Kansas anymore. The world has changed, and we're never going to go back. What else do BAs have to comply with? Well, they have to comply with the minimum, ne minimum necessary principle. So if you're a BA and you have a subcontractor that does work for you, but that subcontractor only needs a limited amount of PHI, but because you're lazy or it's just easier to do, you give them all the PHI that the covered entity gave you, you're in violation of the minimum necessary because the, your subcontractor only needed a subset, and you gave them all. Right? So that's what the minimum necessary principle is. BAs are required to have business associate agreements with their subs. We talked about that. BAs must now monitor, not the operations, Right? Because nobody can monitor someone else's operations 24-7. That, that's ridiculous. But a BA must monitor the agreement. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if you know that your covered entity is in material breach, you can't look the other way. Okay? If you know that your subcontractor business associate is in material breach, you can't look the other way. Okay? Requirements in the business associate agreements cascade down to subcontractors, subcontractors or subcontractors, right, recursively all the way down, and who knows where that chain ends. Um, obviously, it's probably, you know, three or four deep, but it could go a lot deeper, I suppose, depending on, on what's being done. So, now, covered entities and BAs will be allowed to operate under existing agreements for one year. That one year has expired. It expired in September 2014. So, if you didn't update your 
uh, business associate agreement as per the omnibus rule, not as per the High Tech Act. All right. That if you if you had a high tech ready business associate agreement, you you were grandfathered in for a year. Now you have to have an omnibus rule ready um, BAA, and you should have had it since September. Okay. Any questions now? Because I'm gonna. I want questions, and I'm, I know there's a lot of material here, material, so we're going through this pretty quick. Yeah, we have three questions. Uh, the first being, if an email is misdirected but encrypted, does it trigger notification? No. We, I mean, almost by definition, if it's encrypted correctly and it's misdirected, then it can't be read. It's unreadable, unusable, indecipherable. The answer would be no. The second question, is there any requirement that CEs must use cross-cut shredders for destruction? No. Uh, look, in, in general, I, m most of you know this. There, there's nothing in the HIPAA rules that are prescriptive. And what do we mean by that? Nothing in the HIPAA rules tell you how to go about complying. What they do is tell you what you should be complying with, right? So they're not, never, they're not ever going to tell you how to comply no matter how long the industry asks because that's, the government is not in the business of working against itself, okay? And so uh, you have to destroy it. You have to destroy the PHI. If it's paper PHI, you have to destroy it in a way that makes it unusable, unreadable, and decipherable, right? you got to, if that means shredding it, if that means and shredding it probably works. You got to find enough shredder. That means setting it on fire. That means burying it. Well, I mean, you just got to destroy it, right? Now, you know, you got to be careful with copiers and things like that that you think aren't uh, capturing PHI. And you got an old copier. You want to do something good, give it to hospice. And whoa, you know, hospice finds out that it had fifty thousand uh, record PHI records. Now, now you're looking at millions of dollars of fine. You got to destroy the media. You got to destroy the PHI so that it's no longer usable to get rid of it. But it's not going to tell you which myth. Look, there are some recommendations as to protocols, degaussing and things like that with respect to media. But um, you know, as far as shredding, I don't think there's any, there's nothing in the rules. Maybe there's some guidance somewhere about how how to do that. Shredding probably works for paper. What's the next question? Oh, we got two more. Uh, can a CE delegate the duty to notify the affected individuals to the to the BA? Yes. Yes. There's nothing that there's nothing that prevents that uh, delegation either to a BA that's performing some business function on your behalf. You know, I mean, of course, if you're a smart BA, you're not. Unless that's your business. Why would you ever accept that responsibility? That's where all the costs come in. The CE just gave you a two, three, ten million dollar gift, right? I mean, I mean, if you're a BA, you're going to be wary, right? But, but there's nothing that prevents that. And some BAs may, in fact, probably are in the business of helping CEs notify. And so, yes, there's nothing that prevents that. Okay, if a nonprofit is not a CE. Maybe a BA or a hybrid organization. They are a resource service for patients. That didn't finish thought. Uh, my question goes on with the first one. Um, I'm not sure. Only oh, uh, okay. Resource Look, let me, service. Let me, let, me, let me let me try let me try to answer the question this way because people get all confused. You could be using what is otherwise PHI, but if you're getting it from a school or somewhere else someone that is not a covered entity, then you're not a business associate, okay? You have to be performing a business function on behalf of a covered entity using the covered entity's PHI for you to be a business associate, right? There are instances where other employers have PHI, schools have PHI. If you're a business that's doing something for them and you get PHI, you're not a business associate. You might be liable under some other state laws and all that, but you're not a business associate. Uh, under the HIPAA regulations. All right, let me continue here, Martin, um, because we got a lot of ground to cover. So, BAs must comply with aspects of the privacy rule that are in the contract. You got to do that. BAs must be aware of the contract because now you're on the hook for monitoring the contract, not the operations, but the contract, which means 
can't look the other way. And of course, the CE is also on the hook for monitoring the contract. So now you have reciprocal mon monitor monitoring for material breach, and BAs are directly on the hook for criminal and civil penalties. That's right out of the statute, 13404C. Okay, so standards for business associate contracts, 164.504E1 for, for um, covered entities for group health plans, 504F1, and if you're um, a CE with multiple covered functions, 504G, if you fall into these latter two groups, you probably have counsel that is helping you with that. So, okay, so who's a covered entity, right? These are basics 101, but look, this is what you'd be surprised how many people really don't understand the basics and and that's what we try to provide clarity so that people do get understand the basics so that they can get grounded and make some progress on their initiatives. A health plan is a covered entity, a health care clearinghouse is a covered entity, and a health care provider. Obviously number three makes up the lion's share of covered entities and it's a health care provider who transmits any health information in electronic form in connection with a transaction covered by this subchapter yada yada yada. I, I, I can't imagine that there's a healthcare provider anywhere today in the US that doesn't transmit something, some health information electronically, right? So that covers just about everybody. Uh, and so the privacy rule applies to covered entities and to business associates. Business associate was redefined um, by the omnibus rule. It didn't change all that much. The takeaway is really that you got to focus on is any business partner that creates, receives, maintains, or transmits PHI for a business function on behalf of a covered entity. That makes you a business associate by operation of law. So here are some examples. These examples like legal, actuarial, accounting, they've been in the rules forever since day one. That's nothing new that, that really uh, wasn't updated by the omnibus rule. Business associate also includes health information organization, e-prescribing gateway, and all these other interoperability entities that you may be dealing with for meaningful use that provide data transmission services with respect to PHI or a CE. The High Tech Act expressly said that these organizations were business associates, okay? Uh, a person that offers a personal a, a person or entity that offers a personal health record to one or, or more individuals on behalf of a covered entity. So here's the thing. This whole personal health record has really gone away. There used to be two players, Google Health and Microsoft Health Vault, that outside of any relationship you may have had with a covered entity, you could upload your personal health information and, and store it there and blah, blah, blah. Google Health got out of that business. Microsoft Health Wallet, as far as I understand, didn't really get out of the business, but they partner with EHR vendors as a bolt-on, and if, you, if it's as a bolt-on to an EHR, then Microsoft becomes a business associate of the covered entity because of that relationship with the EHR vendor. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that. And a subcontractor, same rules apply, that creates, receives, maintains, or transmits BA, uh, PHI on behalf of a business associate. So a BA does not include a healthcare provider, a plan sponsor, a government agency with respect to determining eligibility for enrollment in a government health plan. Usually, if you're not a BA, you know it, right? I mean, you can share uh, PHI for treatment, payment, and operations because you're sharing it with another provider. That doesn't make that other provider your BA. That's just another provider that you're sharing PHI with for the benefit of the patient. Uh, and this is really down, you know, um, in the details of the BA does not include any CE participating in an organized health care arrangement. And if you're participating in that, you probably have counsel helping you. Uh, and if you're confused about that, you can hire me and I'll help you with that. Any third party that stores or maintains, this is the key, PHI on behalf of a CE, stores or maintains, right? So all the cloud vendors that provide electronic health records, yeah, they're your BA. If you got if you have backup going up to the cloud, they're your BA. If you're using Microsoft Office 365, they're a business associate, okay? But HHS has provided this guidance. It does not include, not include a third party that merely provides a conduit for the transmission of PHI. 
like your ISP. So the, the thinking here is, is that the ISP is providing a pipe. The, EPA, the, the PHI is being sent through that pipe, either encrypted or non-encrypted, but it doesn't matter because the ISP is not, in general, uh, inspecting those packets. The NSA is, but the ISP is going to say that it's not. But anyway, it's going through this pipe. It, they're just a conduit. They're not a BA, and you don't have to have a BA agreement with them, right? Your ISP, your wireless service provider, Sprint, at and these are exceptions. Also, also does not include a third party whose contact with PHI, and, th and this is guidance, that previous guidance that HHS has given, where the PHI is incident to the business function performed. So housekeeping and landscaping may uh, incidentally come into contact with PHI, but they don't need PHI to perform the business function that they were hired to perform. That's how you need to think about incident two. Right? If the PHI is required to perform the business function uh, that the CE wants to perform, wants the BA to perform, the business partner to perform, if that requires PHI, then you're a BA. If it's incident to, you're not. So, okay, I'll stop again. Any questions? Yeah, there's two of them. Uh, back to misdirected email instead of going to someone else it stays in house therefore unencrypting the email uh, but the person who received the email erroneously is not part of the patient's team payment healthcare operations and does this fly in the face of the minimum necessary concept no, I don't know if it flies in the face of minimum necessary but it, it, it is a violation of the privacy rule because that that individual uh, that opened the unencrypted email erroneously did not have a need to know but uh, as we'll see there are some exceptions to the definition of breach uh, we're going to cover those exceptions and that fact pattern that scenario may in fact fall into one of those exceptions and and therefore it would not be a breach uh, because it's it because it's one of the exceptions so let, let's cover uh, we'll come back to that scenario when we go through the exceptions Okay. Uh, we have a company that overreads our x-rays and they fax the report to a local dentist and not the requested provider. Do, do we have to report or to report and who should notify the patient? <laughs> That's, uh, okay, let me see if I can decide for this. So I'm assuming and the per, I'm, I'm asking whoever asked this question. I'm assuming that the, the that the person taking the X-rays is a healthcare provider taking X-rays on behalf of a, a covered entity because some doctor asked for X-rays. Yes. Yes. And and that organization that is taking the X-rays then faxed or sent, emailed or whatever, sent the X-rays instead of to the doctor to a dentist. Is that correct? Yeah, no, no. Um, okay. I think there there are overreads of of the X rays that were taken. I think it's just like a consult. I, I, They're I just really overreads know. and give us the. They just overread and give us the results. Is is what she's uh, saying here? Yeah. Well, then, if they give if if they're a provider, if they're a provider, and so there is no. There's no breach there. That's just two healthcare providers working together on behalf of the patient, right? That's treat. That's one of the. It's part of the treatment, payment, and operations exception. There's that's that goes on all day, every day, twenty four seven. I mean, unless I'm just reading the question, but uh, you could ask the person. You could unmute that person if 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 well, if, 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 they, if they would like. They, were, they I guess the X rays were. Not supposed to go to the dentist. That's that's what I'm concluding. Well, that's now. what I thought. That's what I did. Yeah. They weren't. If they weren't supposed to go to the dentist, then that's a breach, right? They went to the wrong person, right? Now, does it fall within one of the exceptions? We could cover that. That one probably doesn't. Who would have to notify? Well, the X-ray uh, company is a healthcare provider. They're the one that caused the breach. They got to notify. It wasn't. It wasn't the original provider that caused the breach. They didn't send it to the the dentist, it was the other provider that sent it. Okay. okay. Um, 
If I use a contractor that stores PHI to a cloud storage provider, do I need a BAA with the provider or does the BAA agreement with the contractor only? Or is the BAA agreement? Well, if you have, a, if you have, um, If you have an arrangement for a provider, a, a let, let's say a, a uh, whatever a technical technology consulting firm, and you know to store your backups off-site, all right, and obviously they're they're you know they're, they're going to be your BA, right? But if they they then would have a relationship with whatever cloud provider they are using to actually store your backups. Okay, so you could you could see a scenario we got a technology company that sets up how the backup's gonna work, that makes sure on a nightly basis it does work, but it's all gone to Amazon, Amazon's cloud. Well, you don't have to have a, a uh, BAA with Amazon, your technology partner has to have one. Okay? You you're on the hook for those immediate next relationships. You're not on the hook for BAAs all the way down the line. Okay, let me move on here, and we'll take some more later. So what is protected health information? It's individually identifiable health information that is transmitted or maintained in any form or medium by a CE or its BA. Transmitted or maintained in any form or medium. That means paper, guys. You know, paper's going to be around for a long time. You can click here and see the definition of PHI. The new definition, by the way, of PHI, because it's omnibus rule modified, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, but you can go out there to 160.103 and see the information. So the omnibus rule, the term health information, now means any information, including genetic information. So that was a change by the omnibus rule, whether oral or recorded in any form or medium. That's what health information means. It's, and it's created or received by a health care provider, yada, yada, and relates to the past, present, or future physical or mental health or condition of an individual. That's the definition of health information. You can see that's quite broad. So what's individually identifiable health information? Well, it's health information that includes demographic information collected from an individual and is created or received by a health care provider, health plan, blah, 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 relates to the past, present, blah, 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 but that identifies the individual, right? It, it provides some, a way to identify the individual. That makes individually identifiable health information different than health information because now you have identity. And then... Protected health information is individually identifiable health information that meets this criteria, okay? Except as provided in paragraph two, where there's some narrow exceptions that is transmitted by electronic media, maintained in electronic media, or transmitted or maintained in any other form or medium. That means all your electronic PHI, all your paper PHI, regardless of how it's maintained, it is all PHI if it meets this definition. And the exceptions are really, really narrow. It excludes education records covered by the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Okay, any records described uh, in that same statutory section and employment records held by a covered entity in its role as an employer. Okay, because some covered entities, some employers are also health plans, but in its role as an employer, that's not now. This last one was added by the omnibus rule. Any PHI for a person who has been deceased for more than 50 years is no longer PHI. Death plus 50. Now, don't be confused. Don't think that this means that you got to keep PHI for death plus 50. That's a whole different conversation. There is no requirement to keep it for X amount of years. You have to, based on your own operations, come out. Uh, and determine that. So it doesn't mean you got to keep PHI. It just means that death plus 50 after that, it's no longer PHI. You don't have to protect it anymore because it's not PHI. So PHI now includes genetic information and now does not include PHI for a person who has been deceased for more than 50 years. Characteristics of PHI contains health information that identifies the individual. That's the primary characteristics relates to an individual's physical or mental health or the provision of or payment for health care. Right, we just covered that. Just covered what is not PHI. If you de-identify it uh, in a statistically sound manner, 
right? Then it's not PHI any longer, right? You got it. You got it now. If you're doing this for research purposes, you're going to have to have a, a, a uh, some sort of arrangement document, and you better hire a professional to de-identify it, or you may be liable. But if it's de-identified correctly, it's not PHI. Now, now we're getting to breach notification and the analytical framework, and this framework comes from our breach notification framework product that we sell as part of our subscription okay and this is the this is the analysis that you have to go through and it's changed and the omnibus rule changed it because of a brouhaha regarding risk of harm analysis and yada yada let me walk you through this these are the questions that you have to walk through to determine whether notification is triggered first question was there an impermissible use or disclosure of unsecured PHI? That question actually has two parts. Impermissible use or disclosure, what does that mean? That means a violation of the privacy rule. If there's no violation of the privacy rule, not that, that, not that that's easy to determine. In fact, our framework has flow charts that walk you through the privacy rule to try to figure out if it was a violation of the privacy rule. But that's what that means. Impermissible use or disclosure means violation of the privacy rule. Unsecured PHI means exactly what we set up front, PHI that has not been secured according to the NIST protocols. Right? That's unsecured PHI. So if the question to that is yes, if the answer is yes, it wasn't, there was an impermissible use, that means there was a violation of uh, the privacy rule, it was unsecured PHI, you go on to the next part of the framework. If the answer is no, you stop. So the answer is yes, does an exception to the breach rule apply? There are three in the definition. Okay. If no exception applies, then you got to ask, is there a low probability that the protected health information was compromised? It's no longer a risk of harm, it's low, prob it's low probability, and the CE, the covered entity, together with his business associate under certain scenarios, the burden of proof is on you to prove that it's low probability, and the presumption is that there was no low probability. The presumption is that there was a breach. If you get to step three, the presumption on the part of the government is there was a breach, and you better have a compelling argument to justify that it wasn't a breach. Okay, two components to that first question, impermissible use or disclosure and unsecured PHI. Unsecured PHI, we talked about, it's got to be unusable. It, it, it's protected information that has not been rendered unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable according to the protocols. Here are the protocols. So if you guys were dying to figure out which, which ones they were, here they are. Go out to the NIST site. You can download them. You have your tech guys read them. You know, they're there for you. Now, we, we talked about this. An impermissible use or disclosure is one that violates the HIPAA privacy rule. Well, the question that begs the question, how do you know? But before that, before that, did this violation, did this security incident, it, did it pertain to an information system that had PHI in it to begin with? Right? So if I'm an auditor, that's why I'm going to say, Talk to me about your security incident management system. How does that work? Where is it logged? Who is it communicated to? What analysis, analytical process do you go through? Where is it logged? That's what I want to talk about first. Okay. So you should be logging all incidents, attempted breaches, real breaches. You need to log them. If you can't log them, how, how, how can you report on them? Right? But the first question you should be asking is, was this attempted breach regarding a system that contained PHI? If it's yes, then you create an incident, an incident document and you go on to breach analysis. If the answer is no, it was to your inventory system or something, then you can review the incident for compliance with some other law, but you're done. Right? So this is pretty basic. First of all, determine was it an information system that contained PHI? Here's an example out of our framework of a breach notification document for really just half a page, you know, I think it's three or four pages long, where you document every single every single breach or attempted breach. Was PHI secured? Right? At 100,000 feet, that looks like that's an easy question. That should be an easy question to answer. If it was secured, if the answer is yes, then there's no breach by, by definition. You're, you take advantage of the safe harbor. 
notice you still document that in, the, in your complete uh, you complete the incident document saying yes there was a, a, a breach of our network but it wasn't um, it, I mean there was a compromise of our network but it wasn't a breach because the information was encrypted and then you're done right otherwise it wasn't secure you you go on to the notification analysis right so we've covered this if, it, if PHI is secure to go into the secretary's guidance there can't be a breach by definition you take advantage of the safe harbor now you should be aware the security rules suggest but does not mandate the use of encryption therefore you could be in compliance with the security rule uh, and not be encrypting but if you're not encrypting you're not going to take advantage of the safe harbor and remember those weasel words reasonable and appropriate that are used in the security rule you can bet that if you have a major breach and you haven't encrypted some hungry lawyer uh, is going to file a class action lawsuit under a state law theory of negligence saying you weren't you didn't do what was reasonable and appropriate and that's why thousands of records were compromised and that's why we're bringing suit and that will be likely uh, be a suit brought under some kind of negligence theory under state law. Uh, if, the rec uh, if the recommended technologies are not used, then obviously if you didn't meet the protocols or you use something less secure than what NIST, uh, an encryption protocol uh, that is less effective than what NIST recommends, then it's going to be treated as unsecured. Now the practical reality is no matter if you try to en encrypt everything you could, you know, you're going to have some PHI encrypted in some paper for a while, right? Because we've had paper forever. The paper is just not going to go away. You should, you should be, you should have a, a a data retention policy that tries to make that paper go away because you're reducing your liability, right? If you've encrypted everything, you take advantage of the safe harbor, then your paper remains at risk. Now, granted, the paper is not going to get hacked into from some network, and you, you're not going to have million, million, million uh, records of PHI file folders in your car that get stolen, but you should have a data retention policy that tries to get rid of that paper after a while. What is a while? Well, that's up to, you know, that's, a, that's another webinar that we can do. Uh, from a security rule compliance perspective, it's critical that the required security rule risk analysis should capture where encryption and related technologies have been applied. Why? Well, you, shouldn't, well, you need to have that inventory anyway, because that's, that's part of the security rule. But then, you can, then you're, you're, uh, the group that you report incidents to can say, oh, wait a minute, are we fully encrypting this information system? Yes, well, we're good. We, you know, we, we just log that, you know, close the, uh, the incident, and, and you're done. So um, PHI at rest is PHI that is stored, right? That's the line share of PHI. It's stored on your server, it's stored on laptops, it's stored on phones, it's stored on PCs, right? That's PHI at rest. That is the lion's share of um, the PHI that you would want to encrypt. The other part is PHI in motion. Any emails being sent, anything being sent across the wire, right, is PHI in motion and you want to encrypt that as well, right? And it's the encryption method recommended by NIST is TLS, and TLS is really, you know, you, where you see HTTPS, and, and uh, companies say they're using secured sockets, layers, SSL. They may be saying they're using SSL, but most of them are really using TLS now. But that's 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 the protocol that uh, was recommended that NIST recommends to follow. Okay, and where do you want to look? You want to look at all the touch points where you might be sending PHI across the wire to make sure that, uh, that they're encrypted using TLS. Okay, I'm not going to go through these publications. You guys, there, there's publication 800-88. tells you how to sanitize uh, PHI when, when, you, when you want to destroy it. There's certain things that you got to follow. You can clear it. You can purge it. You can destroy it depends on the media you guys can read this just make sure that you implement the processes that 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 does these things so if I'm an auditor again I'm gonna say what show tell me and show me what your sanitiz sanitization methods are and remember you know we recommend that you have policies processes and tracking mechanisms if you tell me that you have a process in place but you can't show me when 
a single piece of equipment has ever been sanitized according to your process, then I'm thinking you got a process in place, but you never use it. And that's that's probably uh, it's not like it's not as bad as not having one at all, but pretty close, pretty close. Okay, so is the pH is the PHI secured? Remember, we're still on question one of the analytical framework. What looked like an obvious question is not so obvious now, right? Because it, to answer the question, is the PHI secured? You got to know was it at, was it in rest? Was it in motion? You know, what was it? What was the state? Are we using the NIST protocols or not? Etc. Right? Okay. The same thing with impermissible use or disclosure at the, at 100,000 feet. Easy. Was the privacy rule violated? No. No breach by definition. Complete the incident document. Close it. You're done. But hey, how do you know whether or not the privacy rule was violated? Well, the the way you know it is you got to walk through the general rule. See, was it disclosed to a patient? Yes. Well. No breach by definition because the patient can have access to its own uh, P to his or her own PHI. Was there a valid authorization? Yes. No breach. Was it disclosed to a rep legal representative? Yes. Right. You have to walk through the general rule, uh, which is 164.502, to figure out whether or not there was a breach, whether or not there was an impermissible use or disclosure under the privacy rule. Okay, I'm going to stop here because that's question one. At this point, you have determined that there has been an impermissible use of disclosure of unsecured PHI, so you're ready to go on to the second step of the analytical framework, which is what are the exceptions? And there are three. So I'm going to stop and see if there's questions. Yes, we have a few. Our company uh, provides billing services for several ERCEs. If PHI belonging to one of our clients with whom we have a BA is misdirected to another client with whom we have a, also have a BA, is this a breach or not? Because all are bound by HIPAA to maintain privacy, the privacy of the info. Well, let's see. Use the framework. Was what was it an impermissible use or disclosure of unsecured PHI? The answer to that question is yes. That other that other client of yours that received the PHI that shouldn't have had no business getting that PHI. I mean, it's clear that the answer to question number one is yes. So let's see if there's an exception. So these these exceptions come right out of the definition of breach. You go out to the HIPAA survival guide. I think this is a URL here. You, you, you're going to see the word for word. And I encourage you guys to go read the statute. If you're unclear, don't be, don't guess or ask your friend or Google. Just go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide and read the source. Read the law itself. You, you, um, you'll be surprised that it's, it's, you know, after a few, after a few dozen viewings, it, you know, it starts to sound like English. You know. Anyway, the three exceptions. Exception number one: under certain conditions. Any unintentional acquisition, access, or use of PHI by a workforce member or person acting under the authority of a CE or a BA, if no further use or disclosure is contemplated. Well, you know, this workforce member seems to say exactly that. The workforce member, unintentional, this would be the wrong nurse picked up the chart. It's not part of the. It's not part of the clinical team taking care of the patient. She works at the hospital. She picked up the sh the, ch the chart by mistake. Yeah, you know, and you got the chart back. Well, there's no further use or disclosure. No harm, no foul. I mean, why would this be? This happens all the time, right? This shouldn't be a breach. Common sense says this shouldn't be a breach, right? So that's an exception. So, but that scenario that we're talking about here, where it got sent to a different. Uh, covered entity, that, that, that's not the same workforce member. I don't think it falls under there. Okay, two, any inadvertent disclosure by a person who's authorized to access PHI at a CUE or BA to another person authorized to access PHI at the same covered entity or business associate. Hmm. Don't know, but it ain't the same. This scenario is not the same covered entity or business associate. It's a different covered entity or business associate. Yes, right. This is trying to get at the fact that, well, 
you know, in inadvertent disclosure, you made a mistake, who's authorized to access PHI, to another person authorized to access PHI, and maybe not this PHI, but it's still authorized. So you disclosed it, you didn't disclose it to, I mean, you know, you disclosed it to a, a nurse uh, or a therapist, but you didn't disclose it to the administrator or somebody that does it has no access at all to PHI. That doesn't seem to fit that one either. What about the third exception? The disclosure of PHI where a CE or BA has a good faith belief that an unauthorized person to whom the disclosure was was made would not reasonably have been able to retain such information. You know, this the hypotheticals um, that deal with these inceptions were covered in that 500-page PDF of the omnibus rule. This this last one, here's the here's the hypothetical. So so you're wheeling somebody out of the hospital. You give uh, you give the uh, chart or copy of the chart, copy of the meds or whatever to the wrong person. You realized right after you gave it to the wrong person that uh, that it was the wrong person. You grab it back from that person, and you know exception three would probably apply. Right? It's a disclosure of PHI, which the CE or BA has a good faith belief that an unauthorized person. So this person was clearly unauthorized because you gave it to the wrong person. But they couldn't reasonably have retained the information. They probably didn't even get a chance to read it because as soon as you realized it, you grabbed it back. Okay. Now, what if they got all the way downstairs and you know out the door and you ran after them, caught a different elevator? You know what? Yeah, then you know they might have read it. You know. Um, but notice, none of these seem to directly apply. None of these exceptions to the scenario of the billing company that sent sent it to the wrong um, covered entity. Now, maybe, maybe here, maybe number one, under certain conditions, any unintentional acquisition, well, it was unintentional access or use of PHI by a workforce member or person acting under the authority, if no, well, you know what? It was unintentional acquisition because you sent it to the wrong covered entity, and somebody uh, somebody at that covered entity got it. But if you know, but if there's no further use or disclosure, if they called you and they said, you know what, we got this fax, we got it inadvertently, we we're, we're gonna we destroyed it, we just pitched it. That may fit, right? So looking at it harder, you might make you might be able to make a compelling argument, or at least a good faith argument, under exception number one that you know we sent it to the wrong CE. They realized it. They got workforce members that are trained. You know we could be good. So look, my point is there are no bright line rules here. You have to go through the analysis. You have to document the analysis. You have to take each case. Uh, as an individual specific set of facts that you're going to do the analysis of and then come to some conclusion. All right. So if it applies, if one of the exceptions apply, you're done. You put that in the, in the incident document, you're done. Okay. If no exception applies, okay, now you're at the point, at this point you've determined there was an impermissible use, unsecured PHI, no breach exceptions apply, and therefore what remains to be determined is whether there was a low probability that the PHI in question was compromised. I already mentioned this, but the, the presumption is a breach at this point. The guidance says that you have four factors that you should look at. The nature and extent of the PHI involved, the unauthorized person who used the PHI, and the PHI that was actually acquired or viewed. Now, let's say that that you know, you determine that that scenario with the billing company, uh, they really didn't meet the exception. Could you make a compelling argument that there was a low probability the PHI in question was compromised? You know, under that scenario, you probably could. You know, yeah, you got you sent a fax, they called you back. You know, it might depend though. If they if they called you back right away and say we got this fax, they call you back two weeks from now. Who knows, right? That changes the fact pattern. Who knows what what happened? Well, what happened? To, what happened to it during those two weeks? Did the you know? Did it, I mean? Was it available? At, you know, for the public to to look at, or people just walking through the halls? It opens up a whole different can of worms. 
the unauthorized person who used the PHI or to whom the PHI was disclosed. Well, in this scenario we're talking about, it was disclosed to another covered entity. You know, that kind of argues in favor of low probability. Was whether the PHI was actually acquired or viewed. It was acquired, and it was probably viewed. Uh, and the extent to which the risk to the PHI has been mitigated. Again, look, you got to do the analysis. There aren't any bright line rules. I probably, I probably would argue if I were your attorney under this set of facts that you know what, with these facts, either the exception applies or the low probability. There was a low probability that the, the PHI in question was compromised because the person who got it inadvertently called us right back. They said they were going to destroy it. I, I think I would, you know, make that argument. Uh, you know, every day, all day in court with, um, you know, um, with a good faith that, that we're putting forth an argument that um, that is reasonable, if not compelling. So, as discussed, the omnibus rule did away with the risk of harm analysis. It was too subjective and replaced it with a more, quote unquote, objective risk assessment approach. That's what we just looked at, those four factors. So, therefore, breach notification is not required. Under the omnibus rule, if a CE or BA demonstrates through the risk assessment that there is a low probability that the PHI has been compromised. Okay, remember, this is only if you got the step three of the analytical framework. That's the only time that this low probability kicks in. There was a low probability that the PHI has been rather than having to demonstrate that there's no significant risk of harm to the individual, all that stuff has gone by the wayside. You use this risk assessment approach, you look at the four factors and you make the determination. All right, so here's the framework um, at a high level again. Was there impermissible use or disclosure on secure PHI? No exceptions apply. Probability threshold exceeded, then you got to notify, right? At 1,000, here it is. There was an impermissible use or disclosure of unsecured PHI. None of the exceptions apply. It wasn't a low probability. You got to notify. All right, let's take some questions here. Um. Could you speak to using kaput vendors like TrueCrypt as an encryption provider? Would this be grounds for not meeting reasonable measures? I don't know. I don't know that particular vendor, but it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the vendor that you use. You better verify that meant that vendor is meeting the protocol that this that HHS provided in guidance. I mean, you would assume, right? But assume it's not going to work here, right? You, you, that you, just because you hired a vendor, you got to ask the right questions. Otherwise, you didn't do your due diligence with respect to that business associate, right? You just can't hire any old business associate and say, "Oh, yeah, we do encryption." Well, how long have you been doing it? What are the protocols that you use? You know, blah blah blah. Well, how how do you test the fact that it worked? So it's not a question of what vendor you use. It's a question of does that vendor use the right protocols? There, the second question uh, is, where can we find the flowcharts referencing what they've seen before besides here? These flowcharts are nowhere. They're part of our breach notification product that we sell as part of our subscription, or you can buy the breach notification framework itself. That's where they came from. And that's the last question we have at the moment. Okay, so notification to stakeholders. We've now determined that you got to notify. So, providing notification according to applicable law. The statute is Section 13402. That's where it all started, uh, the High Tech Act. Notice the individual should include a description of what happened and the description of the types of unsecured PHI that were involved in the breach, such as full name, social security number, date of birth, home address, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Notice that individuals should include steps individuals should take to protect themselves. A brief description of what you are doing to investigate the breach. These are all requirements of the notification. They're not like, um, they're must-dos, not like if you feel like it. you got to do these. They're part of the statute. you got to provide contact procedures for individuals to ask questions or learn additional information, which must include, must include a toll-free number, an email address, website, or postal address. Okay, providing notification according to applicable no law. Notice to HHS and the media, where applicable, we're going to talk about what where applicable means, should include information similar to what is provided to the individuals. You know, what kind, what kind of uh, uh, 
PHI was compromised, what steps you're taking to mitigate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you may not know this. A lot of people don't know this. The required notice is impacted by the quality of the contact information that a, con a covered entity has in its possession and the number of individuals whose PHI has been compromised. Okay, because look, it's all about notification, right? If you've got bad contact information and you use that contact information to notify, well, then the individual is not going to get notified because the contact information is bad, right? So here's a uh, flow chart. Actually, to be honest with you, here's the thing. You can, out on our website, I believe, if you go to the breach notification, uh, if you go to the breach notification product, I think you can get these. I think we have made and we do make the, the flow charts available. You don't get the analysis, but the flow charts are, are available free. Um, I think there's 12 of them that are part of the framework, so you can get you can get these um, these flow charts. So, look, out of date, out of date. How many? This is contact information. If it's greater than 10, greater than 10, right? That's not a big number. Substitute notice website homepage or major print or broadcast media and toll free number less than 10 out of date you still got to do substitute notice written or telephone or other means and toll free number so you don't have to do it you don't have to put it on the website but you still got to do uh, provide toll free number uh, if not right there's no out of date uh, contact information and first class mail email but email only if agreed to by the individual Right? If you didn't, uh, if the individual didn't say up front that you could notify them via email, then you can't. Okay. Now, if there were greater than 500 individuals impacted in a particular state or jurisdiction, then notice the prominent media outlet serving the state or ju jurisdiction is required. Greater than 500, and you know what? Well, let's say, for example, you're in. Florida, and if you have patients, and, and you have uh, offices throughout Florida, you, you have patients in Miami, you have patients in Tampa, you have patients in Jacksonville. You're probably going to have to notify major media in all those areas because not one um, media provider, right, vendor is going to cover the entire state. So it won't be sufficient just to notify one. You got to cover wherever the individuals are. If now, let's say you had 250 in uh, Florida and 300 in Georgia well then you don't have to notify media because you got to notify media if you have greater than 500 in a single state or jurisdiction okay so that's controlling greater than 500 in Florida you got to notify you could have 10,000 probably spread across the US could you I don't know if mathematically you could um, Martin probably not 10,000 you couldn't mathematically you couldn't do it, but you could have lots spread across various states and potentially not have to notify media. The, the chances of that happening is probably slim, but it's possible. Okay, regarding notification to HHS, I don't know why they did this, but you know, here if it's greater than or equal to 500, you got 60 days to notify HHS, and you're going to end up on the wall of shame, right? Because HHS has a website. You get on that website, it says the name of your organization, how many records were breached, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? I don't know of any way to get off of that website. Once you're on the wall of shame, I think you stay there. Uh, if it's less, now this is total. This is total. So if you had 350 in Florida and what? 150 in Alabama, now you got 500. Uh, now you got to notify HHS within 60 days. It doesn't care. Notification in HHS is not dependent on the state or jurisdiction. It's this is a total number greater than or equal to 500. Total, no, regardless of jurisdiction, you got to notify 60 days. If it's less, you still got to notify HHS at the end of the year. 60 days past the end of the calendar year. I mean, like, right, July, December 31st. 60 days past that, you got to notify. If you had one record that was breached. You still got to notify HHS for that year. Okay, so individuals always get notified. HHS always get notified. The media is going to depend on whether you have greater than 500 in a single state or jurisdiction. Okay, questions? 
Is the breach notification uh, included in the subscription plan? It is, indeed. Okay, that answers that question. Can the media provider be USA Today, which is national and theoretically cover, covers all areas? No, all I don't think uh, I don't think anybody's. I don't think the HHS is going to buy because how many people read USA Today? I tell you, anybody under thirty doesn't read a newspaper at all, right? So I don't know. You're not going to get by with USA Today. You probably have major media. Probably means television media. That, that, that people, you know, listen to their, you know, Channel 9 here in Tampa, right? It gives the traffic report. It means media that actually has some hope of reaching where your patients live. If you try to do something cute, like you use USA Today, you know, you're going to wind up paying for it. You're going to wind up paying not only the fine, but probably some willful neglect or something on top of that. So, no, I would not do anything cute like you try to use USA Today or the National Enquirer or People Magazine or some crazy thing like that. Also, does the media have to be print since now some media is online only? No, it's you know what? They're, they're, it's not prescriptive. They don't tell you. But the, 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 the analysis is going to be what kind of media would reach the patients, would, read, would reach these patients whose PHI was compromised. What's going to, I mean, we all know. People don't read much, right? It's probably going to be television media. That's probably who you got to notify. Um, then there's, can you show the breach decision tree again? No, you got to pay for that. <laughs> no. Well, I, I can make sure they get I'm, the slides. I'm, 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 I'm kidding. Everybody got copies of the slides or should have got copies. If you didn't get copies of the slides, We'll send them to you, but Martin sent out copies of the slides, so you, you got you got copies of it. Um, Here's one, we had, one, one last question. If the media does not run the story, are you still deemed as having complied? No, you got to no, you got to make sure that it that it runs. Otherwise, you know, I mean, what good did it do? You didn't get, and you didn't notify anybody. You're not gonna you're not gonna get out of, of this by being cute. The, the, look, if I was your lawyer. I'm like, you know what? That's a crazy idea. <laughs> you got to, you got, we got to notify them. We got to make sure that it's going to run. Otherwise, we haven't done what we were supposed to do. And that's all we have for the moment. All right. So this is where, this is partly where we started. How are you tracking security incidents? If you don't have a good way to answer this question right now, if I'm walking in, that's where I'm. I'm when it gets to the security rule, I'm not asking about encryption. I'm not asking about a risk assessment. Um, initially, I'm going to ask about all that stuff, but I'm going to ask. Tell me who your security officer is. Oh, you don't have one name, really? You know that that's a requirement. Tell me how you track security incidents. You don't, wait wait a minute, you, you don't track security incidents? Really? How are you going to report a breach? See, you're going to be off to the wrong start right away. So you better have a system for tracking security incidents. We provide you a system in our breach notification framework, some spreadsheets and a way not Part of the subscription is part of the product. You know, it, is it you know the the best way? It's a pretty darn good way, right? It is a way you can show. Look, here's how we track every incident. Right, log security incident. That's where you got to start, right? So you got to track incidents, and you got to be able to show that you're tracking. What does a security incident mean? Is this actually defined? It means the attempted or successful. See, an attempt qualifies. Unauthorized access use disclosure modification. Let me give you an example. You got your PHI at, uh, at rest totally encrypted, but you also became aware that somebody breached your network. The bad guys are smart. You can you you better assume because they're that smart that they're going to be able to breach your network, your firewall, all that. They're going to get through. All right. But if you were, if you had everything encrypted, was there an attempt? Yep. Is that a security incident? Yep. Do you need to log it? Yep. Was it a breach? Nope. Do you need to complete an incident document? Yep. But all you say is breached, but hey, that system was um, secured, encrypted as per the protocol. We're good. We're done. There was no, nothing was compromised. Information system. What does that mean? Well, it means an interconnected set of information, resources, blah, blah, blah. A system normally includes hardware, software, information, data communication, blah, blah, blah. It could be paper or electronic. Nothing mandates it to be like 
electronics. So you could have, obviously, this is just making a point here, that you can have a breach of a paper system, and you should log that breach, or an attempted breach of a paper system. You should log it. You treat it like any other breach. Okay, what's the cost if you don't comply? Now, I got to tell you, these numbers get so crazy, and I know the, the Pawnee if you know, and, and maybe I'm not pronouncing it right, because I, I, I know it's Mr. Larry, maybe it's Ponymon, Ponymon, I say Ponymon. They've been doing this for a long time. They come out with an annual survey. They actually came out with the, the 214 survey. And you know what? They don't say it's 108, uh, 88 per record. In fact, I think in healthcare they say now that it's 316 per record. But the example I like to use is, look, if you had a breach of 5,000 records, if, if it was 200 and for healthcare 200 is low, that's a million dollars, 500 times I mean, 5,000 times 200, I've done the math like 20 times to check, right? That's a million dollars. And how many records do you think you can fit on a thumb drive these days? Like 50,000, 100,000, God knows. I mean, 5,000 records would be a really small breach, and you're already looking at a million dollar cost per, right? A million dollar cost for that many records. It's expensive. It's really expensive. It's the number is really, really big, and the more, the more records, the bigger it gets. So what's the fix? Well, you know, there is no, like, panacea here. There's no, uh, you know, magic button, you no, know, the easy button at Staples that you're going to, that you're going to push, you know. HHS advocates, advocates building a culture of compliance. That really means changing your thinking about compliance. All right, and so what we think is that what, that what that means in practice is building privacy and security into your compliance, into your organizational DNA. It's not an afterthought. It's not the same old feel-good training you used to do before the High Tech Act with anecdotes like if you wouldn't sell it, you know, if you wouldn't say it in an elevator, then don't say, you know, blah. I mean, you got, everybody's got to get smarter now, more literate, right? That's what we mean by you know, changing the organizational DNA, tongue-in-cheek, you can go out and look at these five compliance strategies that are guaranteed to fail. Now, we understand the pushback the industry is going to. We understand, and some docs have told me to my face, they'd rather go to jail than comply, right? Or they'd rather retire than comply. They don't feel like big brother is step. I mean, look, that's just a generational issue. You know, those docs will eventually retire. The younger docs are understanding that the world has changed. You know, that old thinking ain't going to work anymore. And in the meantime, if you're a compliance officer, you're just going to have to struggle through that, right? But th those are cultural changes. Look, you can. there are cost-effective solutions out there. That's not your biggest challenge right now. Your biggest challenge is changing organizational thinking with respect to compliance. Uh, look, if you use the wrong strategy, if you don't get started, you know, if you, if you look like you've really thumbed your nose at the law, you haven't done anything since 2005, you got those old HIPAA manuals, those three-ring binders that you try to give to the auditor, you're going to be found to be in willful neglect. And that can be $50,000 per incident. All right, we're going to look at a table in a second. So what do you need? Right, this is what we preach. You need visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. How do you get visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance? you got to have policies. you got to have organizational processes that underpin the policies. And you got to have tracking mechanisms. So, for example, there's a training requirement in the security rule. There's a training requirement in the privacy rule. You've got to have a policy that says we intend to train all workforce members, yada, yada, once a year, whatever. Then you've got to have a process. How, do you, how, how are you going to do that? Is it going to be video training, classroom training? Do they have to take a test? What? How do you do that? What's the process? And then three, show me when your staff got trained. If you can't show, if you're not tracking it, then I'm not going to. You know, if I'm the auditor, I'm going to say, well, you know, you're really not doing anything. Yeah, you got a policy and process, but you're not using it. So what's the point, right? you got to have policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms. That's how you get visible, demonstrable evidence, and that's how you establish a culture of compliance. So, you know, this culture of compliance is, yeah, it sounds like kumbaya, everybody holding hands and saying we're going to comply. Look, when the courts aren't going to buy that nonsense. You know, you're going to have to show evidence if, when it comes down to that that you're compliant. Okay, so, look, breach notification, that is the 800-pound gorilla. It, you're, if you're going to get busted, it's not because of an audit. Yes, audits are coming, but the, the likelihood of any 
particular covered entity being audited is going to be small, right? HHS doesn't have unlimited resources to go audit everybody. If you have a breach or you have a patient complaint that on its face looks like willful neglect, then an audit is mandated, right? So if you get angry patients with you and they're going to, they, they file a complaint with HHS and look, they say, you know what, I asked for my PHI and they refused to give it to me or they gave it to me in 60 days and I know I'm supposed to get it in 30, guess what? HHS is going to investigate that. They're going to audit you, all right? And patients are getting smarter all the time. So it's either a, 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 a pissed off patient, excuse my French, or breach notification that's going to get you in trouble. And you know what? There's this table. What you need to know is the C and D. C is a willful neglect violation that you found and you corrected on your own within 30 days. D is a single violation that's willful neglect that you found, but you didn't correct, correct in 30 days. They remain uncorrected. This 1,500,000 is not the maximum amount of fines that you that can be applied okay it's the maximum amount per identical violation now if you got 5,000 or 50,000 or 100,000 or a million records that's going to be treated as one violation all right so that would be a million and a half that's what HHS has said but if they come in and audit and find 20 other violations that's in addition to the million five so you could have God knows what I mean Signet got fined 4.3 million Take away here, that million and a half is not a maximum fine. There's all this stuff about how you get from one tier to the next. I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm going to quickly cover this omnibus rule summary. Um, it, look, this breach notification stuff, it's not new. It's been law for years now, August 24, 2009. That's when the breach notification interim final rule went into effect. Right, you got no, you know, HHS has slow walked this thing. You absolutely have no excuse to, uh, you know, say, oh, gee, I didn't know. That that ain't gonna fly. <clears throat> uh, HHS for covered entities and, and business associates is gonna be Health and Human Services, the enforcement agency. Uh, the omnibus rule did amend the definition of breach. We went through that. It's at 164.402. It's got those exceptions built in. Uh, it's presumed to be a breach now. We talked about that. This. Uh, risk analysis is a radical departure from the old risk of harm analysis, okay? That's gone. The risk of harm is gone. You got to do this uh, RA with the factors. Uh, now, you could you could notify every time there's a breach. Nothing prevents that, right? But So the risk analysis is only required uh, really, well, look, as your lawyer, I would say do it all the time, but you could notify. You can notify for every every incident, and it, it's it's only absolutely required if um, if you want to demonstrate that no notification is required. Well, I would do it every time because you never know when there's going to be a lawsuit or whatever, right? But you could choose to notify on your own if you wanted to. There is an exception. The omnibus rule eliminates the exception that limited data sets, and this is we're getting now into the weeds. But limited data sets that did not include dates of birth and zip codes were exempted from breach notification. Uh, now that's out, all right? Even if it doesn't include date of birth or zip code, the four-factor analysis, you still got to do it. CEs and BAs have the burden of proof. Uh, users and disclosures can't violate the minimum necessary principle. CE ultimately maintains the obligation to notify individuals, HHS, media. It can delegate the way we talked before. Uh, Okay, yeah. All the omnibus rule says is, look, the clock doesn't start ticking until you discover, not when the breach occurred, but if you're the CE, when you discover the breach. So, you know, if you know if the VA didn't notify you for three years, well, then you didn't know. So the 60 days would start after you were notified. So, look, here's our shameless plug. You got the breach notification product and about 21 other products that are sold either individually or part of our uh, as part of our subscription. Uh, we like to think we provide you the recipe, the how-to, not just the ingredients. They're educational products that you can start executing on day one. And I think we got time for a few more questions. Maybe. Uh, 
Our, yes. Here's one. Our SIEM system logs attempts constantly. Our defenses routinely repel these. Sure, these are not all reportable attempts. I think that's surely these are not all reportable attempts. Actually, they are. <laughs> they are. They are. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, look, how you deal with it is, you know, you know, you know how many attempts were made per day. What I would do is have a log, say, today, 100 attempts were made, and they were repelled. That's, you know, an entry in a spreadsheet. That's how I would deal with that problem. Are they an attempt? Yeah, they're an attempt. I mean, they're clearly an attempt. Somebody attempted and you repelled. And the second question is more of a request, and that's to you. Can you do an audit webinar in the near future? Actually, we did one, um, I think, two webinars ago, um, I believe. Now, the, 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 these webinars, um, we make them available for a couple of weeks for people that weren't able to get in, like, there's only, we only have 100 seats here, and we, we had about 200 people that subscribed to this webinar. Uh, but generally, the, the webinars are just made available for our subscribers, but from time to time, we will rotate and make uh, those uh, other webinars available. So we'll see if we can't uh, make them available for a limited period of time. Uh, we can't make that audit webinar um available for a limited period of time uh, because the next webinar is going to be on cyber liability insurance the pros and cons so that's all the questions we have all right thanks guys um, have a great day appreciate you uh, listening